On May 7, 2017, I headed down towards Baltimore to spend a day with artist David Brewster. Is art right. popular in Baltimore? It is now. It is. <laughs> it is now. <laughs> this looks yeah. nice. It's real nice, man. Our day started in the horse country of Baltimore County, where David grew up. How are you doing, David? I'm doing great. Oh my gosh, what's this? That's Lucia. Hi, Lucia. They are such good pals. <laughs> Don't you help me out all the time? Don't you help me out all the time make pictures? Yes, you do. cabin situated at Butler and Dover, known as the Golden Triangle, is a premier example of a vernacular structure built in the 1800s throughout Maryland, built out of American chestnut, which is now extinct. They fascinate me, the mortise and tenon, the way the parts fit together so simply. The proportions represent such a perfect volume in relationship to the landscape. One of the attractions to these log cabins is they were vacant. I would often go into the cellars, which were built out of fieldstone, and look around for artifacts, old bottles, something that reflected the early settlers, the people that lived in these buildings. And then also the state of decay. The aluminum roofs that were completely rusted and the crumbling red brick chimney stack. In some ways, they were barely recognizable as buildings. They were so deteriorated. Once you're inside the house, you have to wade through a huge debris field of generations of stuff. Nature has totally reclaimed these buildings. There's a whole mysterious ecosystem. These giant black turkey vultures, they were nesting in old Victrola cabinets. Integral to a small working farm in Maryland were the Fieldstone Spring Houses, which were built over an active spring not far from the house where milk was cooled. On the exterior, you see the spring exiting, and it's usually in early spring, very green from watercress. If you look carefully into the shallow depths of the spring, you would see these huge granddaddy crayfish. I asked David to tell me about how he was trained to become an artist. Well, I grew up in Glinden on Long Necker Road. I was fairly isolated and my parents were very active outside the home and so drawing and sketching was the way I entertained myself. As a young man, he attended the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, the Maryland Institute College of Art, and eventually got his master's degree from the University of Pennsylvania. But his favorite art school was in France. The Leo Marchut School of Painting and Drawing in Aix-en-Provence was especially well-suited for my temperament and a school of seeing followed in the footsteps of artists like Cezanne and Van Gogh, working directly from life in a landscape where there's enormous unity between architecture and farmland. 
He has refined his vision over many decades, going from a highly naturalistic style to a more poetic and expressionistic sensibility. I can honestly say I'm not a formulaic painter. I am motivated by what I see. Every time I set up to paint, it's a wrestling match with trying to make as strong of a visual connection as I possibly can, bringing to life what I originally saw. Talking to David, I soon realized how obsessed he is with the past, the lives of the settlers, and the Native Americans that preceded them, but also how the modern world has affected Maryland. I think his energetic painting style captures this sense of continuous flux perfectly. Here's an example of one log cabin that was in habitable condition. I was here 14 months ago and painted it in a January, and now today I'm surprised to see that it's completely bulldozed away. And all that I can see is this window shutter. There's a plan for four or five brand new houses going up in its stead. A quick drive down 83 took us to this city. Surprisingly, what attracts me in the urban landscape is it's not that much different than what I'm drawn to in the country. Man-made structures that are distressed and where nature has reclaimed and unified something that may not actually be beautiful to start. Hi. I still got the picture from the last one you did. You remember that? Yeah. Huh. That's something. What, was it good? It was excellent. What do you think of what he's doing? I'm not gonna think about it, I'm gonna feel. What do you feel? I feel that he's right at the moment in history that he should be, just like Picasso was where he was. Even though Picasso times had a tendency to take and steal and use, but then build on that to be a creative genius. Bo Digliani and Picasso, you know, studied Africa art and African ways. And the Moors, once they came through Spain, Spain was never the same again. My man is feeling it. There are people in this community that need to feel that and be taught how to feel that. And there are people in this community that can teach him. So it's, it's the universe expanding and contracting at the same time. He's telling the story and he is the story. And this part of the town, this historic black area, that every building has history to it. Justice Thurgood Marshall lived in the 1600 block of Division Street. I have always been an outdoor painter. All year round. I have a substantial setup, well suited for wind and working on a large scale. My imagination has been the most effective when I'm able to work directly from life. However, in 2010, when I started doing commission suites for universities and various institutions, I started transitioning into the studio. I realized that all these years I had a reservoir of knowledge and information based on all my time spent observing nature and that I was able to create a very different kind of narrative and highlight aspects of the world that interested me beyond the observation of the landscape. My mother was a very exuberant, energetic personality and creative in her own right. She was a huge advocate of my creative endeavors and took an enormous interest in my development. My mother was a docent for the Baltimore Museum of Art and one day she had a bunch of elementary school kids running around the gallery. A bunch collapsed on one of those ottomans where most docents would have yelled at the kids and said, get up and stand up properly and engage art. She said, well, well, that's an interesting way to look at art. I think I'm going to try that. 
She was open to enormous possibility, and she encouraged me to take advantage of every opportunity to express myself, which I have. I remember one day in my room listening to, Hey there, lonely girl. Suddenly this car pulls up. My mother was being carried out of the car, wrapped in blankets, and her arm was in a sling, and she had had a serious horse fall. The horse rolled on her wrist and pulverized the bones during a country amateur race. So typical of my parents who were passionate about all kinds of sports. Every weekend they spent racing through the countryside on horses and consequently would have really serious injuries. But heal and they would get up and go again. So my parents were fearless, cavalier, even though I was scared to death of horses. <laughs> but it did manifest itself in the way that I pursued my art. Addicted to painting outdoors, and I liked the challenge of setting up on steep sloping embankments along highways. My parents' tenacity and physical stamina has had a major influence on the rather athletic approach that I bring to my own work. When I was growing up in the 70s, gay was not even a common word used to describe homosexual men or lesbian women. But even at an early age, I sensed that I preferred the affections of men. I always really craved a friendship with an older brother or a male mentor because my own father was very detached. Uh, when I was 16, I went out one day and noticed that someone had carved fag on the hood of my vehicle. I was so mortified. Who thinks that I'm a fag and is so disgusted by this prospect? It was to happen several times later throughout my life, but I became better equipped to deal with it. I was teaching at a high school in Connecticut, and one morning in one of my books, again, I saw the word fag scrawled. But this time, I really saw it as a cry for help from one of my students. And so immediately, I came out to the school. There was an all-school chapel. I stood up and shared what had happened, but also that, you know, first and foremost, I was a teacher. I was a human being, and my sexual orientation was irrelevant. I also use that opportunity to invite whoever it may be that's questioning their orientation to come to me, and, and I would love to be supportive and be a positive role model. My mother never said a word to me about my sexual orientation and never made a judgment. She just accepted who I was. My father, however, I think he took it as a personal affront. He felt like I was making a choice that was designed to hurt him. In sympathy to him, he is from a generation where that didn't even begin to be a possibility. It was a challenging time also because I came of age during the AIDS epidemic. I can remember one afternoon taking a swim with my father and he said, am I gonna get AIDS if I get into the water with you? I was 22. I could understand his limitations in coming to terms with my homosexuality, but he was just afraid of it. It took a long time for him to accept it. And finally realizing that I was a good person, that I was a productive, articulate, bright guy that was out in the world. The overarching experience of shame and isolation associated with being gay in the 70s and 80s and even into the mid-90s was challenging. It's remarkable today how far we've come. For my generation, because there were no positive role models and this devastating epidemic, that experience has made me more compassionate and connect more to the experience of marginalized people who feel alienated and left out, not taken care of, not embraced by society. I think my own experience of alienation and shame and the fear that I experienced even from my own family, I took that to heart in doing this project for the Maryland Historical Society. 
the Maryland Historical Society in Baltimore, has curated a show of David Brewster's art, which explores issues of gender, race, America's political divide, and the evolving urban and rural landscape. Since all human experience is predominantly about the inner necessity to love and to survive, I discovered that there is nothing fully foreign to me, nothing that I cannot relate to. I came to a place in my own artistic expression where I encountered unsurpassed freedom and joy in interpreting such compelling narratives. It has been a privilege and honor to interpret these themes for Maryland.